There is a cost to discipleship. This is true with all things that are worth doing. There is a cost. I remember the look on my parents' face when, when there was something that was costing them. I was, as you know, the second oldest of five children who were separated by eight years of age. When my youngest sister was a newborn, my oldest sister was eight years old, and my parents were not even 30 yet. You can imagine how our household might have sometimes been. Now, I have a three-year-old daughter, and I am blessed by the fact that when I come home, I am greeted with uh, joy and with love, but I am also sometimes tried, because when my tanks are low and my energy is depleted, I still have to play chase. I still have to be a human jungle gym. I still have to throw her in the air and catch her when she jumps down the stairs into my arms. I still have to play the random game that she made up that day or do whatever it is that she wants me to do. And it is during those times when my energy is low that I remember the look that my parents would get during the times when they were tried. It was a look of determination. It was a look of surrender. But mostly it was a look of resolve that said, we are going to do this. We are going to do it well. We are parents. And that is what we are called to be. They were determined. And the reason why I thought of that story, the way that their faces would be set, is because in Luke chapter 9, we are told that Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem. Now, in, uh, just shortly before that, in verse 22, Jesus says this. He says, I must endure great suffering and be rejected and be sentenced to death, only to be raised again. In other words, Jesus had predicted his death. He knew it was going to happen in Jerusalem. And one night, I can imagine, he looked south down a dusty road he was, that he was on with his disciples. He looked down that road towards Jerusalem. And despite all that he knew was going to happen there, he set his face towards that goal. He knew the purpose of his life, and he was determined to fulfill that purpose. One of the things that is true is that even though Jesus knew that he was going to suffer alone, be rejected alone, and die alone, he knew that his life was serving as an example for others to follow. He knew that his disciples were called, were obligated to follow him to the cross. He was setting forth the example for them. And so in this passage where he sets his, faith, his face to Jerusalem, it's coupled, it's actually ended with three examples of the conditions of discipleship. Shortly before this, uh, these three stories that Jesus tells, he had listed what it meant to be a disciple. In verse 23 of chapter 9, he says, if anybody wants to become my disciple, they must deny themselves, they must take up their cross, and they must follow me. In other words, wherever I go, you must go too. So Jesus tells three stories of what it means to be a disciple. The first one that Jesus uh, tells is that someone comes up to him and says, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. The second story Jesus tells, or that, that we're told, is that Jesus commands someone to follow him, and the response he receives is, Lord, first let me go bury my father which Jesus replies, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. It's a harsh condition. Finally, in the third example, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus' reply is simple. 
And again, it's harsh. He says, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The message that Jesus is sending is very clear. In discipleship, we are not allowed to follow Jesus inside of our own lifestyles, according to our own desires. Jesus calls us to be disciples of him first. And if those things that are in our life don't fit with the commands that he gives to us, then they should fall away. He wants us to put, to set our face towards the cross, just as his was. In the last example of discipleship that Jesus uses, he used a really interesting metaphor. Because in verse 51, as we talked about, Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem. And in this last example, he uses the example of someone who is plowing a field. Now, uh, if, if someone was plowing a field in Jesus' day, what they would do is they would put their left hand on a light plow and they would goad their oxen with their right hand. They would keep their gaze fixed firmly on the furrow in front of them. If they were to look to the right or to the left, the furrow, the line, would become crooked. There's a harsh reality in Jesus' words that we do not often hear in the church. In the church, we regularly try to communicate the immediate and eternal and abundant and unending depths of the grace of God. And while Jesus is not saying that God's grace is, not rest is restricted, what he is saying is that there are expectations once it's received. And harshly, but truthfully, not all live up to those expectations. The harsh reality in Jesus' words is that not all are fit for the kingdom of God. And it's not because they are not able. It's because their lives did not change once they became followers of Jesus. In other words, they tried to accept God's grace on their own terms. This guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a German theologian in Nazi Germany. He was a pastor. He was an author. He was an evangelist. He was involved in a resistance against the Nazi regime and as a result was hanged in the concentration camp at Flossenburg on April 9, 1945. He wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. In that book, he writes these words. It says, Cheap grace is the, dead, is the deadly enemy of our church. We are fighting today for costly grace. Cheap grace means the justification of the sin without the justification of the sinner. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ. Costly grace, on the other hand, is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will gladly go and sell all that he has. It is the kingly rule of Christ for whose sake a man will pluck out his eye, which causes him to stumble. It is costly because it condemns sin, and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it cost God the life of his son. And what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Grace of God is free, but it costs God, or but it costs us everything. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, when Jesus calls a man, he bids him to come and die in order that he might truly live. As we respond to Jesus' call on our lives to follow him, we have to ask, will we, like he in this Lenten season, set our faces towards the cross? Jesus' ministry was focused on the purpose to which he was called, which was to proclaim that the kingdom of God is at hand. It is among us. 
It is near. He knew that in order to bring us into his kingdom, he had to die so that we could be raised again into it. We follow him on that road. So he has asked, he's placed conditions on discipleship, that we would deny ourselves, our own desires, and follow him. And in following him, he has asked that we would take up our cross, in essence, dying to ourselves so that he can raise up in us a new life that is focused on him. Tonight, as you come forward for the ashes, I would ask that you would let your footsteps forward be the symbol that you are denying the life that you lead that is contrary to the rule of Christ in your life. And as we place the ashes, the cross, on your forehead, that you would take that as the symbol of carrying your cross and dying to yourself. And as you head back into your seats, as you walk back to your seats, know that Christ is raising up in you a new life. That in these 40 days, I would encourage you to live out as we follow Christ on that road.